my talk uh, from the one that's in the, the brochure. And, and the reason for this is I want you to, I want to put the spark in your head about the importance and relevance of metacognition to theorizing about reasoning. So why do we need a theory of metacognition to understand how people reason? And so I've, I've framed the title this way, Causes and Consequences of Confidence in Reasoning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the many collaborators that I'm fortunate to have and who have contributed um, to this work. Uh, I don't know if this pointer is working here. Oh, yeah, it is. Okay. So, uh, Rockefeller, Ackerman, and I have been working on developing a framework of meta reasoning um, that uh, recently published in, uh, in, in a chapter in a book. Uh, my various experimental uh, collaborators and uh, the many students in, in the lab who have contributed. So this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to sp spend uh, quite a bit of time uh, talking about metacognition and what it is um, and relative to what we think of as normal cognition. I'm going to develop the feeling of rightness framework that Lyndon uh, referred to and talk a little bit about the framework that we developed to um, test, that, uh, th test that theory and some of the key findings. I'm, I'm hoping to go through that part uh, relatively quickly because uh, I'd like to talk about some new data which refers to um, a prospective judgment of solvability. That is when people encounter a reasoning problem for the first time, how do they assess the difficulty um, of the problem? So first of all, let's talk about what we mean by metacognition. I think we all understand what we mean by cognition. Okay, so the cognition refers to that, those very, very complex process that perceive, comprehend, attend, remember, think. Right? So the, uh, the basis of our thoughts, basically. And as Lyndon uh, suggested, metacognition refers to a, a secondary set of processes that basically let us know how well we're doing, right? How did that go? Do you need to think about it further? Have you got the right answer? Okay. So they are both concerned with monitoring and control, assessing how well performance is doing and deciding what to do next. Now deciding, that's a bit of a homunculus and I'm actually gonna de fly if you can, uh, that term. Okay, and I'd just like to start by giving some fairly everyday examples where you might, where, where that should uh, alert you to how prevalent metacognition is in your life. Workshops like these, I don't know about you, but my memory is horrible. I had to give up studying memory in grad school because <laughs> it was just uh, the blind leading the blind. So, but in workshops like this, it invariably happens that I meet someone that I'm not sure. You know, you meet lots of people and you go, you, hello Henry, right away, you, you, there's, there's, you're confident that you remember. There are other people you meet that you're confident you've never met before, but there are, whole, there are people you meet that you're not very sure. You're pretty sure you've met this person. The name might be John, might not be John. There's a sense of certainty there. You, you might have a feeling of recognition, but no sense of recollection. Right? And that is going to determine how you behave. If you're fairly sure you've got the name right, oh, hello, John, how's it going? Long time since we've met. If you're fairly sure you haven't, you've taken more circuitous route, right? Oh, good to see you again, right? Uh, no name, and hope that, hope that the name comes up sometime soon. Okay, so that is all a metacognitive process, and the metacognitive feeling of uncertainty is the monitoring process and the control process of which route do you take? Do you call the person by name or do you do the, do the circle? When you're choosing between alternatives, same thing happens, right? So we had the experience of recently buying a car and of course there, there are myriad alternatives out there and there's a process of gathering information and data and test driving and so on until one of these choices engenders more confidence than the other. We're, we, we want this one and not that one. And it can be as complex as that or as easy as deciding do I want blueberry or strawberry yogurt this morning. Okay. 
have I put in enough effort? Okay. Have I, have I done enough work on this project? Have I polished this paper well enough so that it's going to get by reviewer C? Mark said, well, we, we know it's never going to get by reviewer C, but maybe it'll get by reviewer B and the editor. Will this talk fit into an hour? <laughs> this, is, you know, this is a judgment that you make all the time, right? Have I, have I, have I put too much in? Have I, have, I, uh, have I got enough to talk about? These are all metacognitive judgments. And the, the basic... Uh, reason that they're interesting, and as I hope these examples show, is that confidence is the arbiter of action. Okay? When we are feeling less confident, we are either going to rethink, gather more data, uh, or um, go back to the drawing board, and when we're confident, we act. Okay, so the, 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 the uh, choice point between taking action and not, or what kind of action we take, is really comes down to a degree of confidence. Okay, and confidence is a central part of what we think about in terms of metacognition. Okay, it is really metacognition and confidence go hand in hand. Now, oftentimes when I talk about metacognition, I think people get get the idea that we're talking about something like this, that it's thinking about thinking, that it's some deeply reflective sort of zen, introspective sort of process by which you, you, you sort of do the, um, the spring cleaning of your, 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 your cognitive cup, you know, you know, that sort of thing. But really, what I'm talking about is something more akin to this. It's really processes that plan, monitor, and assess one comprehension or, or performance and they're passive. They're more like a thermometer than they are like the thinker. That is, they're, they're taking a passive reading of what's going on, right? And then when, when, when an event happens, and in the case of a thermometer, when the temperature drops below um, a certain threshold, it initiates the control process and turns on the fur furnace. Okay, so what we're talking about are sort of more passive rather than more introspective cues. And you know, in, in terms of um, the, the literature, people who study education usually are aiming to instill these types of processes. People who study memory are looking more at these types of processes, things that are sort of either built into the system or learned uh, over, the, uh, over the course of development. Okay, so there are big two sort of streams of literature here. One associated with education that it aims to instill reflectivity in students. Another of a whole um, uh, program of memory and learning where the, the analogy is really more low level. We're looking for low level uh, processes. Okay. And so the cues to metacognition that we're talking about then tend to be implicit. Okay. We're thinking about things that trundle on under the, under the, under the sea of awareness. So my, this is my analogy here. As cognitive scientists, we know that 99.9% .9 of cognitive activity happens below the surface, is implicit. Right? Uh, very little of it happens up here, above the surface. And the same is true for the processes that are monitoring our cognitions that they too tend to be low-level implicit processes. And so what are they? Well, what I'm going to, to do is to make the case that in reasoning, the same as in memory, the cue, uh, that they're cue-based, that people respond to the cues associated with processing the problem. And those cues give rise to these various sort of metacognitive feelings that fall loosely under an umbrella of confidence. And what that means is the accuracy of our confidence or the accuracy of these um, metamemory cues depends entirely on the accuracy of the cues that they're derived from themselves. Okay? So if, we're, if, we're, if um, uh, the, the thermometer is well calibrated, it'll turn on the, thermostat, uh, the, the furnace at the right time. If the thermometer is poorly calibrated, you're going to be cold. Right? And it's the same thing here. If the cues that we're responding to are correlated with accuracy, then our confidence will be correlated with accuracy. Otherwise, it won't be. 
Okay? And this is a fairly well accepted uh, statement in um, the field of metamemory. Uh, what I really like to do is to make the case that this is also true of thinking and reasoning. Even though we like to think of thinking and reasoning as something that happens mostly up here. I think Ruth, um, uh, in her comments yesterday, articulated it very nicely that we may see the input and the output of a reasoning process, but we are not always able to see what happens in between. So much even of what we consider to be reasoning behavior uh, takes place under here. Okay. Okay, so as I said with my uh, colleague, uh, Rakafet Ackerman, we've uh, been working on developing a framework for meta-reasoning. Um, and what we've argued is that uh, reasoning and problem solving frequently, but not always, take place over a longer period of time than the memory theorists get to work with. And so this allows us a greater scope for thinking about um, what met metacognition might do in this context. Okay. I'm going to talk today about two judgments, the feeling of rightness and the judgment of solvability. Uh, the feeling of rightness is the sort of, um, uh, the most closely akin to the judgments of memory. These happen when the sort of quick intuitive response that uh, Lyndon and Jonathan talked about comes to mind. Okay. Those cases where something comes to mind fairly rapidly. Okay. Um, and what I argue is that that um, answer comes with, with a second dimension, which I've called the feeling of rightness. And basically it's, does this answer feel right? And if it does, that's your cue that everything is well, and if it doesn't, that's the cue that you need to do some more thinking. And if that's the case, if you know, basically the, the, the analytic engine is turned on and off by this feeling of rightness, and the feeling of rightness is based on cues, then we need to understand what cues the feeling of rightness is responding to. I'm going to spend also a little bit of time talking about judgments of solvability, which is brand new. There's very little literature on this. The, st the study I have to, to talk with you about today is unpublished, but it's interesting. So I thought I would, I would present it here. And basically, this is the situation where you're confronted with a novel problem. So this is, nothing comes to mind quickly. So this is something you have to start from scratch on, and you make a judgment, can I solve this problem? Is this problem solvable? Do I want to invest my time in working on this? There are some other judgments that we talk about. The judgments of ongoing reasoning, so that in a problem-solving episode, you're monitoring your performance, how close am I getting to the goal state? And Rakafet Ackerman has published a very interesting paper in JEP General um, on that. Um, and then a final judgment of confidence, which is after all the problem solving is said and done, how do I feel about it? So I'm going to be concentrating on these two, the feeling of rightness and the judgment of solvability. Okay, so I'm not going to spend very much time here as we've just had two talks about dual processes and about how we think about intuitive and analytic thinking. I'm just going to make the case that um, we study in the lab processes that happen in the world all the time. That is, we can, we can give people these tricky little problems if it takes five machines, five minutes, five, uh, to, uh, five minutes to make five widgets. How long does it take 100 machines to make 100 widgets? And about 70% of the people answer 100, and in fact, the correct answer is 5. So that's a tricky little problem, but as the, the text below here suggests, that is just a way to get at the sorts of decisions people are prone to making in the world, right? So people often act on instinct, foregoing analytic thinking when it would have served them well. So what I've got here is the basic paradigm that we've developed to try and understand the interplay between the feeling of rightness and analytic thinking. And basically what we do is we ask people to give two answers to any given reasoning problem. So we, we've used all manner of reasoning problems, simple ones, complex ones, logical ones, probabilistic ones, um, sort of the whole kitchen sink here. Um, 
So we give them the problem, we tell them to answer quickly, sometimes we put a deadline to sort of enforce the fast part of it, but what we tell them is that we're interested in intuition. So please tell us what your intuitions are. Don't, don't second guess yourself, just, just blurt it out. And from that, we get a measure of answer fluency, which is how quickly did the answer come to mind. Okay? We get people to give us um, a feeling rightness judgment, usually using a Likert scale. Then we give them the second opportunity to rethink. You know, take, take your time, make sure it's right this time, um, and give us your final answer. And from this, we get two indices of analytic thinking. The first is, how long did they spend? Okay, so that the longer that they spent is an indication that they've spent then more thinking about it. And did they change their mind? So did they change their first answer to the second answer? Okay, and the basic summary of, of what I'm about to present fairly quickly is that this initial response has two dimensions. The answer, which is produced by cognitive processes, and a feeling about that answer, which is something that we would call a metacognitive process. And this metacognitive uh, feeling, the feeling of rightness, predicts both of these measures of analytic thinking time. Okay? So if the feeling of rightness is strong, people are less likely to think and less likely to change. Okay? And we've got evidence that the feeling of rightness varies from item to item. So if you give people a series of problems, the feeling of rightness changes from problem to problem. And what, it what the variables that cause it to change are variables such as fluency and familiarity. And there, there's a variety of them. I'm just going to talk about these two today. OK. So these are data we published in 2013. Uh, they were collected in the context of performance on waste and selection task, which I'm not going to go over here, because the selection task, the task itself, was really just a vehicle to studying metacognition. So the actual performance on the task wasn't of much interest. What we were interested in is how we could, how we could use this task to, to study metacognition. And what I've done here on the bottom is I've just taken all of the feeling of rightness ratings. So here is all the times that people gave a feeling of rightness of one, which is, I'm thinking, I'm guessing. And here are all the times that people gave a feeling of rightness of seven, which is, I'm pretty sure I'm right. Okay? And then it, these answers in the middle. And what I did is I just gathered up all the responses on, on this axis here is response time, how long they spent thinking, and here, the probability that they change their answer. And I plotted those two things as a function of the feeling of rightness. Okay? And I think the story is clear. We're just looking at these top two um, lines here at the moment. The, the open circles are response time. And what you can see is a, almost a perfect linear drop in response time. This is how long did they spend rethinking the problem as a function of their initial feeling of rightness judgment. Okay. And it's a very strong linear relationship. If the feeling of rightness is low, people spend a lot of time. If the feeling of rightness is high, people spend very little time. Similarly, for answer change, okay, when the feeling of rightness is low, people change their answers about 30% of the time. When the feeling of rightness is high, less than 5% of the time. So again, a strong linear relationship between the feeling of rightness and these two measures of analytic engagement. So we've replicated this basic pattern in a number of different studies. So this is not an artifact of waste and selection tasks. As I said, we've used it in a, lot, a wide variety of reasoning tasks. And the, the relationship between the feeling of rightness and analytic thinking is very robust. Okay, so it does seem like the feeling of rightness does act like a switch. It's the arbiter of uh, reflective linking in this case. So if that's the case, the next question that we have to ask ourselves, so where does this feeling come from? How do we, how do we what, is the, what are the cues that tell us that we feel right? 
I mean, and, and the most obvious thing is to say, well, people just know when they're right, okay? If they get the answer right, they know it, and their feeling of rightness goes up. Would that it were so simple, okay? We've done a wide, we, like I said, we've done, we've done maybe a dozen studies with the feeling of rightness. And when you look at the uh, correlation between the feeling of rightness and the um, correctness of the answer, it's low. You, you would do a happy dance if it got to be as high as 0.3, but wouldn't be surprised when it's zero. That is, that people cannot discriminate between right and wrong answers on many of these tasks. Okay. Sometimes there's a modest relationship, and sometimes on difficult ones, like Lyndon was talking about, the, the categorical syllogisms, people just don't know. Okay. So I think we can just rule that out, okay? that there's probably not much room in, in, in our theorizing about feeling of rightness and other metacognitive cues for them actually being correct, especially in difficult problems. Instead, what we've proposed is that other, like other cues in, in the literature and meta memory in particular, that people um, base these judgments on the experience they have when they're solving the problem. And a big one is what we've called fluency. That is the ease with which the answer comes to mind. How quickly does the answer come to mind? Answers that come to mind generate uh, a sense of rightness. And my colleague, Sasha Topolinsky, has done lots of work to show that answers that come to mind sort of generate a positive affect, that they actually do engender a feeling, a positive feeling of rightness. So I'm going to go back here to this, this figure. Um, and what we're looking for this time is the line on the bottom, which is our measure of answer fluency. That is, how long did the people take to generate the first answer. And again, what you can see is a nice linear relationship here between the time it takes to generate the answer and the feeling of rightness. Answers that uh, take a long time, people are very, show low confidence in. Answers that come to mind quickly, people show confidence in. Okay, and then, again, this, this is not that surprising because there's a really large literature showing exactly this relationship in the, in the domain of memory. Okay. Another thing that we've looked at is familiarity. Okay. So in reasoning, we often give people these abstract, arbitrary things to reason about. Right? And I think uh, uh, um, the general perception is that they're more difficult. And so maybe people have trouble with these um, uh, 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 arbitrary things because they're more difficult. So we looked at familiarity as a cue to the feeling of rightness. And this is work that I did with, with Henry Markovitz. And this is a very simple experiment. So we give people um, two kinds of premises, one that uses familiar content and one that uses this abstract unfamiliar content that we're, we're familiar with. And as you note, these two arguments are of the same form. They're, they're identical. The only difference is this one is familiar and this one is unfamiliar. Okay. Now, in terms of actual difficulty, they're identical also. That is, people perform equally well on the two types of problems. So again, we can rule out sort of accuracy as a cue to uh, feeling of rightness. But the feeling of rightness differs substantially between the two. People are more confident, have a, have a stronger feeling of rightness when the material they're reasoning about is familiar, even when they're not performing any more poorly on the, on the uh, arbitrary task. Okay. So the argument here is that the feeling of rightness is based on cues that are associated with solving the problems. Um, fluency and familiarity are two that I've covered. We've investigated a number of others, um, including the sort of conflict effects that Vinod and Lyndon have talked about. So conflict is one among many different cues uh, to uh, the feeling of rightness that initiates analytic thinking. Okay. In summary, 
Okay, these, these initial intuitive answers to problems are accompanied by uh, a feeling of rightness that serves a control function um, regarding the degree of subsequent analytic engagement. So when the feeling of rightness is low or weak, um, that's a cue that the problem needs thinking and people are more likely to change their answer. And this feeling of rightness is derived not necessarily from the accuracy of people's performance, but from other cues available to them in the environment. How quickly it came to mind, is the material familiar, uh, how much time they had to solve the problem. And this, I think, is a humbling take-home message. Right? Things feel right, not necessarily because they are right. They feel right because they're fast or they're familiar. Right? And this is, if, if you take home anything from this talk, take that home. Okay? The next time you, you're feeling confident and sure about something, uh, know that that confidence comes from a, a place that might be quite unrelated to the wisdom or accuracy of the choices that you're, you're thinking about. Okay. Um, and then as the final um, uh, note, feeling of rightness, like all cues, is going to be accurate to the extent that the cues that it's based on are accurate. So in a, pro in a problem solving set, for example, where fluency is an accurate cue to, to difficulty, you're going to get a good correlation between feeling of rightness and accuracy. So if, if the cue or, or if familiarity is a good cue to accuracy, then the feeling of rightness will be a good cue. But in many cases, it's not. And so the feeling of rightness may not be very well correlated with accuracy. Okay. So I'd like to move on here and talk about um, a different uh, uh, metacognitive judgment called the judgment of solvability. So, in addition to buying a, uh, a car, we recently moved house, which engendered a search for furniture um, for that, that the new house required that we didn't have from the old house. And one of the things that we needed was an office desk. Voila. So we go down to the late, uh, local office supply store, we, we look around for a little bit, have a strong feeling of rightness that that's the desk that we want, um, order it, and um, it arrives. <laughs> and I use this example because my immediate judgment of solvability was not in this lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> there is no way. Um, my, my husband had, had a different judgment of solvability, however. Um, so uh, an afternoon of, of sweat and cursing did produce an object that more or less resembles <laughs> this. <laughs> okay. So th the point I'm, I'm trying to make is that this initial assessment was sufficient for me not to even attempt a problem. Right? I, was, I was not even going to try. His judgment was a little bit different, and he thought that he could put it together and did. And so what we're talking about is cases where there isn't an initial answer that comes easily to mind. There's a novel problem, there's a novel situation, and the first decision is, uh, can this problem be solved by me? And then how do people make these judgments? And do these judgments have a role in regulating subsequent behavior? So this is a study that I've done in uh, collaboration with Sasha Tompolinsky and James Mills, and it involves anagrams. Now we chose anagrams for um, two reasons. One is we have some work on the, done that, on the factors that makes, actually make the problems difficult. And two, Sasha did some work on um, uh, elements of the problems that give rise to judgments of solvability. So basically, this is a study that just puts those two things together. And we thought that was, if you're going to make a start, this is the place to start, where you've got some data. So anagrams, uh, uh, if, if you, as you know, are um, word puzzles where you get the words in scrambled up order. And your job is to find a common English word that those letters spell. Um, what we did here is we used a modified two-response procedure. So each person saw 24 items. They saw them in a block. 
Um, they saw each one for 500 milliseconds, which is really short. They then gave a judgment of solvability uh, rating on a scale of 1 to 9. Um, that is, uh, do you think this is a solvable problem or not? And then, because sometimes these solutions pop out, sometimes you just look at the anagram and it, and it pops out, even in a short period of time, we also ask people, you know, did you actually solve it? Right? So I'm just going to show you what a trial looks like. You have to be paying attention because, as I said, 500 milliseconds is short. So here we go. <laughs> okay. All right. So it is a short period of time. Um, then we ask them, um, how sure are you that this is a solvable anagram? And then, did you solve the anagram? And then we gave them a second block of trials where we just presented them like this, and they had 30 seconds to, to work on uh, finding a solution to the problem. Now, the reason we gave such a short deadline, and you know, we can argue about whether it was appropriate or not, is we didn't want people actually solving the problems, right? We, we wanted to, to, to get a sense of their, their judgments without them actually getting the solutions. So, okay. Uh, so the second trial, um, they saw the 24 items they'd seen before plus a new 24 set. Um, they had the option to give up. And this was an important part of the study that didn't work out very well. Um, because that was one of the things that we're most interested in measuring is can, can the JOS predict how well, how often people give up. Um, there are 56 uh, participants and for uh, the purposes of the talk I'm going to focus on two variables. One is pronounceability. And we chose pronounceability because um, it affects both solution difficulty and JOS, at least based on prior literature. Okay? Um, it's a surface cue, so it's, it's, it's not actually related to uh, how difficult it is to solve in, in theory. Um, but nonetheless, people behaviorally show that pronounceability is more difficult. Uh, pronounceable words are more difficult. So if I give you something like hookop versus whatever this uh, translates to in phonetic English, people think this one is going to be easier to solve than that one. The, pr the one that you can pronounce is judged to be easier than uh, the one that isn't, um, but the one that is pronounceable is also more difficult. So there is that sort of ironic effect. It seems easier, but is actually more difficult. Okay? So um, the uh, behavioral data uh, were supplied by Novik and Sherman, and I've got the asterisks here because they were extremely kind to share their materials with us. So they had done a lot of work in developing these sets of anagrams that were free of confounds of other factors, and they very graciously shared that with us. Um, and then we, uh, uh, Sasha sh showed that the pronounceable anagrams have higher judgment solvability, but he didn't actually get them to solve it. So this was just a way to put both of those things together. Our second cue, um, which one might think of as a structural cue, is what we've called convergence. And that's just how well the word, when it's all unscrambled, conforms to um, English regularities. Like how, how, how often do these pairs of letters go together in English? Okay. So we call that a, a structural cue because it has to do not with the surface, not with the anagram itself, but with the target, with the, the actual word. Okay, so we've got uh, anagrams, they're pronounceable or not, or, and they have a strong or weak convergence. Strong convergence is that the word corresponds to English spelling, and weak is it doesn't. And then uh, to, to, be, uh, to provide parity with Novick and Sherman, we divide our sample into the skilled and less skilled reasoners just on a median split. So people who solve the most problems we call the most skilled. Okay, so I'm just going to walk you through this here. Um, this is the data from the first trial. Uh, remember we asked people, did you solve the problem or didn't, didn't you? So um, we wanted to uh, get rid of the, the trials on which people said they solved the problem. Um, so here's the instances in which they solved them. Here's the instances in which they didn't solve them. And here's the judgment of solvability. So as you can see, sensibly, happily, uh, people give higher judgments of solvability to the trials they think they've solved than the ones that they didn't. On 
unhappily and unsensibly, this is not at ceiling. So you would think that if they'd solved the problem, that they would, should be certain that it was at ceiling. But the reason for that comes here. Okay? This is um, the percentage correct the second time around. That is when they're given all the time they want to, to think about it. And again, here's the solved problems. And again, here's the non-solved problems. So the problems that they had said they'd solved before, well, they're, they're doing quite a bit better than the ones they said they didn't solve. Okay. Again, phew, that makes sense. But please note that they're, they're only just above about 50% here. So I interpret this to be another sort of metacognitive phew. People think that they've solved the problem for some reason or another, and they say they did, even when they haven't. Okay, so there's, you know, in addition to the judgment of solvability, I think we've, we've, we've also stumbled across another little cue that we can use to, to assess people's um, uh, judgments in these cases. Okay? Um, and um, you'll see here, it takes people more time to solve the problems that uh, they uh, said they hadn't previously solved than the ones that they had. Okay. All right, so that's just the initial summary data. Um, I'm just going to focus now on these problems here, the ones that they said that they hadn't solved, just to uh, rule out the, 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 the ones that they, they thought they had solved um, the first time around. Okay. Let's look first here at the effect of pronounceability. Now we had expected that people would give higher judgments of solvability for pronounceable than unpronounceable um, anagrams. Okay. Um, and they did, but it's not it doesn't work out uh, significantly. Okay, so the trend is in the correct direction, but the statistics don't back us up. Okay. We'd also expected, based on Sherman and Novick's work, that people would take longer to solve the pronounceable than the unpronounceable problems, and that worked out. Okay, so in replication of their work, people did, in fact, take longer uh, to, for the pronounceable than the unpronounceable. In contrast, however, to their work, uh, we find this effect for our high-skilled people, and whereas they had found it for the lower-skilled people. So the effect of pronounceability here is mostly amongst the higher-skilled people. Okay, okay we have um, a similar thing going on here for convergence. So uh, sort of counterintuitively, we get an effect of convergence on judgments of solvability, that the weaker, uh, 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 the words that have a weaker convergence that are, are, are less good or less sound in terms of English spelling have higher JOS than words that don't. Um, but nonetheless, it takes, I've got the, off. Oh, sorry about that. Um, for the, 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 the solution times, um, the strong words are solved faster, especially for the highly skilled people. Okay, so the, just to, to reiterate here, uh, in terms of judgments of solvability, how solvable are these problems? The strong problems are, are given less, they're, they're judged less solvable, but nonetheless, um, they are easier. They take less time. So um, the point here is, again, that people are basing their judgments on cues that may or may not be very diagnostic of accuracy. Okay, so JOS are Q based. We unfortunately fail to replicate Sasha's uh, pronounceability findings. One hypothesis for that is that we used the five letter anagrams that I showed you here. He used uh, multi-syllabic German ones. And, and, and maybe, maybe this, is, this is an effect of, uh, of, the, of the, the difference in the complexity of the stimuli that we used. Okay. Um, and we also found uh, an effect of convergence, sort of counterintuitively, and um, we're not 100% sure why that is, why people would judge weak convergence words to be more solvable than less convergent words, except that there may be some sort of um, item artifact in terms of the words we use. So we're, we're, we're trying to put together a set of words that um, is balanced on the level of the anagram, so that the anagram itself all, ha all cor have the same um, English uh, correspondences. Okay. 
The cues that inform judgments not, may not be the actual causes of difficulty. Okay, so uh, pronounceability is an actual cause of difficulty and convergence is an actual cause of difficulty, but in neither case do judgments of solvability track that difficulty. And in fact, in the case of convergence, it was opposite. And people judged problems, the, the easier problems to be the more difficult. Okay. Um, we saw overall uh, that the more highly skilled solvers had higher judgments of solvability than less skilled par 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 uh, counterparts. And um, then the next question is, how accurate are these ju judgments of solvability? So when people think that they're going to be able to solve a problem, are they really? Are they able to solve the problem when they're certain that they can't? Do they anyways? Okay. Um, we get a small but significant correlation between um, uh, JOSs and getting it correct. So there's a very, uh, sort of like the accuracy data I showed you with the feeling brightness, right? It's, it's not very strong. Uh, there's a small relationship there, but it's not very big. There is a, a small, again, um, but uh, reliable uh, relationship with did they give up or not? And um, it's not very large because people didn't give up very often. Um, the next time we do the study, we're going to give people a little bit longer. So we gave people 30 seconds. Not very many people gave up in the 30 second interval. So we're going to extend that to a minute. And we're hoping that people will eventually get tired of doing this problem and want, on to, move to, the uh, want to move on to the next one. And so maybe find some, some scope to increase that correlation. Okay. Um, and when people gave a strong judgment of solvability, uh, they had less, um, spent less time uh, solving the problem. So um, there's some evidence that the, the judgment of solvability sort of tracks um, uh, 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 difficulty, but the cues, like most of these metacognitive cues, are imperfectly calibrated uh, be because they're relying on other features of the problem. OK. All right. So the basic conclusion is that people monitor their reasoning processes in much the same way as they monitor their other cognitive processes. They base their monitoring on cues that are available to them on the basis of the experience that they have solving the problems, such as fluency and familiarity. And that the monitoring, that the sense of rightness, the judgment of solvability that you get, is accurate to the cues that you're using are accurate. And, but because the, the environment is complex, these cues are often not uh, very accurate, leading to a miscalibration. These cues are very, like, uh, very likely implicit, which is sort of a neat um, uh, contrast, if you will, that the, well, as I said, I, I used the word, these are the triggers that start the analytic engine, which is considered to be conscious, working memory, um, uh, demanding, and so on. But the cue might be something that is implicit. The, this sense of the feeling of rightness that comes from something that you don't know where it comes from. Why, do you ha why does this feel right? You probably don't know. And yet, that cue is the trigger for analytic thinking. So analytic thinking may well be triggered by something implicit and, and not accessible to introspection. Um, now what we know less about uh, is whether the decision to terminate processing also is due to some sort of implicit cue, which is one of the things I'm thinking about working on next. So how are people satisfied how, how do people come to the conclusion that they, they've put in enough effort, and what's the cues for that? Um, we've got several studies planned next, um, a suite of studies using the, the judgment of solvability paradigm. Um, all the anagrams people got this time around were solvable. Next time around, we're going to throw in some unsolvable ones and, and see how they do with those. Again, what we're really interested in is the giving up. Options. So this is another way to increase the probability they gave up is to give them things that they actually can't solve. Um, we're also looking at how these judgments 
um, are, are related to strategies and how, in terms of, for example, uh, eye movements. So how do people uh, who are confident, uh, what, what's different about their approach to the problem than people who are less confident? And what's the knock-on effect in terms of how they approach the rethinking part of the, the, the study? And then a project that I've had in mind for a long time, but I have not gotten around to yet. I've talked a lot here about the feeling of rightness, about the sense that things are okay. But I think we all know that there's another sense that we sometimes get, and that there's something wrong here. Like, I don't know what it is yet, but something doesn't quite add up. So that feeling of wrongness, um, I think, is a really potent cue for us in, in, our, in our real lives. And that's on, on my plate for uh, where to go with this next. Thank you very much.